Let's pray one more time, please. Jesus, please come. Send your Holy Spirit. Put excitement into the message. Make it clear and plain and um, exhilarating and motivating, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So the past three presentations, and I need to ask something in the back. Would you please turn on the back projector for me? I'm looking at a blank screen. I can't see what you see right now. So for the past three presentations, we have looked at three crucial subjects. In fact, the past four have been some heavy lifting. All the Bible study on the Sabbath, the second coming, um, what happens when you die, and then the destruction of the wicked. But the last three in particular, we looked at the second coming. It's that one-time earth-shattering event when all will personally see Jesus come at the same time. He'll come in person, in the sky, in the clouds, with power and great glory, in flaming fire. All the angels will accompany him. It'll be like lightning streaking across the sky. The sun, moon, and stars will go out. And that's an interesting concept. They don't really have to go out to go out. And here's what I mean. If you had one of those mag lights, really nice bright flashlight, right? And you're shining it in the dark, that's a bright light. If somebody drives up behind you with their car with the bright halogens or maybe one of these Jeeps with those big lights on it, what happens to your light? It didn't go out, but it goes out. It's not even, you can't see it because it is so over... Overshone, over, I was going to say overshadowed, but it's the opposite. Over illuminated. And so whether the sun, moon, and stars actually go out or simply God's glory is so great that they disappear into the sky, the sun, moon, and stars go out. There's a great earthquake. Every mountain and island is moved. There's great noise, loud blast of the trumpet, the shout of the archangel that wakes the dead up. They're raised incorruptible. The saved living are changed in a moment. And we're all caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with him. The lost are running for the rocks and mountains. They want to be hid from the face of Christ. And they are slain by the brightness of his glory, which is a consuming fire to all darkness and sin. And that will be the end of this world as we know it. God's interruption of the cycle of sin and suffering. Then we looked at what happens when you die. The first death that we all must face in our natural lives. A person is a soul. You don't have one, you are one. When the physical body, the dust of the ground, is breathing the breath or spirit of life from God, you become a living soul, a living person. We are alive moment by moment because God is giving us breath. There's no part of any human being in the Bible called immortal. That spirit is just the breath, the spark of life from God, not a conscious thing outside the body. That soul is who you are when you're a breathing body. When we die, we know nothing. Consciousness ends, our thoughts and plans perish. We don't praise God, we go down into silence. Our eternal hope is not in an immortal soul. Our eternal hope is in the resurrection of life from God. Jesus is the first fruit of that resurrection, and he is the promise that he will raise us at the second coming. Satan's original lie was to claim that if we would rebel against God, we could find more life that would put us in a process called dying, but it wouldn't leave us dead. It would leave us more like God. And just about every religion on planet Earth, including most Christians, believe that lie today, that when you die, you're not really dead you've actually transitioned to a higher life form. And that distorts our understanding of who God is, who we are, sin, salvation, the second coming, judgment, and hell, and it leads to monstrous things being said about God. So that took us to the good news about hell, the fire that burns at the end of the age to clean, cleanse the earth of all residue of sin. It will destroy Satan and sin and all who cling to sin, and refuse the salvation offered in Jesus. The wicked are destroyed, they're burned up, only ashes left, not a slow roast for eternity. The fire is really simply the glory of God let loose on the human race at the second coming. Those who trust Christ will be glorified by that glory, vitalized to live forever. 
Those who've refused to trust Christ, that same glory will vaporize and destroy. Everybody will experience the burning glory of God, either to live forever in it or be destroyed forever by it. Everyone will get a resurrection, the righteous to life forever and the lost to judgment and condemnation, what's called the second death. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Because there are no immortal souls, though, you don't have to have a forever unhappy place. You don't have to have an unheaven for immortal souls to be in. They will be put out of their misery forever while we will live in the glory of God forever. Hellfire doesn't sustain the lost in eternal misery. It puts them out of their misery forever. Sin is eradicated, not immortalized in some quarantine of agony. So how does all this come together? The second coming, the resurrections, there are two of them. How does it all fit? And we actually find that that will come together in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, and I have to get my clicker. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, page 1422 in the Bible we supply. We're actually going to start in Revelation 19 and verse 11, because we have to wind up to Revelation 20. Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and makes war. Notice this is war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. Who is that? Clearly, this is Jesus, the Word. Same author here as wrote the Gospel of John that begins, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Now the Word is coming back. The armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, verse 14, followed him on white horses. That would be the angelic host. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule, the word is shepherd in the Greek, rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus rides out on a white horse. The armies of heaven are with him. This is final, total, all-out righteous war. He's coming to claim his rightful position as King of Kings and Lords of Lords, and he's coming to rescue his bride, who is about to be annihilated by the beast and his forces. All of this fits into Daniel 2, the kingdom of the stone, Daniel 7, the son of man coming, Daniel 8, the little horn being cut off without human hand. God steps in. Jesus in sign language portrayed in the second coming. So what happens when Jesus shows up? Verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the great supper of the great God that they may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and all the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So here you have the two sides. Jesus rides in with the armies of heaven. All the powers of earth, except for the redeemed, the ones that are waiting for Jesus and under threat, but all the powers of the earth are allied together. Revelation says they'll finally get together right at the end for a short period of time to try to oppose the coming of Jesus and his takeover. So you have the clash of the two armies. We've already gotten a bit of an idea in verse 17 about what the outcome is going to be because this angel simply calls in the vultures. But verse 20 gives it to us. The beast was captured. And within the false prophet, we will find out who the beast and false prophet are tomorrow night. Pulling it together with the millennium tonight is a little bit ahead, but it helps us be able to really pull things together tonight when we, tomorrow night when we do Revelation 13. 
The beast and the false prophet are two systems of evil, not individuals, as we will see, that are trying to oppress and annihilate God's virgin bride, the church, the saved. The beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So that whole mark of the beast thing, the powers behind it, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Anytime God's glory shows up undiluted where there's sin and darkness, it is fire and brimstone. Like on Sodom and Gomorrah, now at the second coming on the systems of evil. The rest, all those supporting the system of evil, all the lost, were killed with the sword that proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. This is more of a rout than a battle. There's no way that all the powers of Satan and his angels and all the powers of earth could stop God if he wants to take over. He could speak them out of existence. So there's not going to be a prolonged battle here, going back and forth. Who's going to win? You know, When Jesus rides in, it's over. But the evil will be there to try to stop. Now, Revelation 12 introduced us to the dragon, who was the devil in the various human systems, including Rome, opposing Christ, and then going after the church in the Middle Ages. Revelation 13 will introduce us to that beast and false prophet, two beasts in Revelation 13, come back tomorrow night, systems of evil, antagonistic to God's people, who have deliberately set up a system to say, like in, in Daniel 3, bow to the image we make, as opposed to bowing to God or we will kill you. So you have a triumvirate of evil if you read through carefully. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon is Satan. The beast and the false prophet are his allied systems on earth. Now what happens when Jesus rides in? Notice at the very end of chapter uh, 19, in verse 20, the beast and the false prophet were captured. All the soldiers were killed, all the, all the lost that are allied with them. But what happens to the dragon? We've got the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. When Jesus comes, the beast and false prophet system of evil are annihilated and all the people supporting them are killed. But what happens to the dragon, the devil himself. And that's where we get to chapter 20. Then I saw another angel, verse 1 of chapter 20. Then I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who's the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So the systems of evil and all the support troops are destroyed at the second coming of Christ, but Satan is grabbed and bound. Now, of course, this is symbolic. We couldn't physically grab and bind, but you know what? God can. This angel comes down with a great chain, symbolic. Chains couldn't bind demon-possessed men in the Gospels. So this is a chain of, of, of God's power. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, and Satan bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. Kind of like they put Daniel in the lion's den and sealed it. Kind of like they put Jesus in the tomb and sealed it. You can't break the seal unless you have the authority of the one who seals. When God seals, they're not coming out until God breaks the seal. Shut him up in the bottomless pit, set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more. Till the thousand years were finished. Well, where are the nations to be deceived? They were all destroyed by the second coming. So you might call this a chain of circumstances. There's nobody left to deceive on planet Earth. He was sent here. He's stuck here. And there's really nothing to do. He could deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. That, that gives us a hint. We'll see what that means in a few minutes. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years and then released. There's no one to deceive for a thousand years. 
but then he is released. So let's try to figure some of this out. First of all, the word for bottomless pit in the Greek translation of the Old Testament and here in the Greek of Revelation 20 is the word abyss, abyss, abusos, from which we get the English word abyss. And I want you to notice the Greek translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint and its, its um, uh, acronym is LXX for 70 because it was supposedly translated by 70 Hebrew scholars down in Egypt about 200 years before Christ and it actually was the, an authoritative text in the time of Jesus and the Apostles. In fact you find that most of the quotations of the Old Testament in the New Testament most of the places where the New Testament quotes the Old Testament is taken from the Septuagint. The Greek matches. All right? But I want you to notice here, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, which means nothing was built, sculptured. It was just elements rocks, whatever. And it was void or empty, there's no life, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the word there for deep in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament is abyss. So it's interesting, the world in its pre-creation chaos was called the abyss. Now Satan is cast into the abyss. Let's look at one other verse. I need you to go there in your Bibles, Jeremiah 4, page 871. Jeremiah 4, and watch this verse now. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth. What's he looking at? This earth. And indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens had no light. So it's without form and void and dark. You see the parallel? Genesis 1, the earth was without form and void and dark. Here he sees the earth, and it's without form and void, and there's no light. It's dark. So Jeremiah sees the earth, which he see, thinks looks about like probably before it was organized in the first place. But notice, I beheld the mountains, verse 24, and indeed they trembled. All the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, indeed, there was no man. All the humans are gone. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. Evidently, the vultures had picked the bones and flown away, so to speak. I beheld, and indeed, the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down. Is this pre-creation chaos or post-destruction chaos? You see the point? Jeremiah sees here the world in a condition which Genesis called the abyss, without form and void and dark, but it's post-destruction chaos. Thus says the Lord, no, let's back up. I beheld indeed again, verse 26, the fruitful land was a wilderness, all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So how did the earth become destroyed? At the presence of the Lord. That sounds like what we understand in the New Testament as the second coming. Jesus comes, destroys all the people, there are no people left, the cities are burned, fire and brimstone like Sodom and Gomorrah, and the earth is left a wilderness. But evidently he's looking and he can see where there were cities, there's now rubble. It's post-destruction chaos, and that destruction came at the coming of the Lord, the presence of the Lord. For thus says the Lord, the whole land will be desolate, but I will not make a full end. The land will be desolate. Now Revelation tells us a thousand years, and then Satan must be released. So evidently there's a time of desolation, and then something's going to happen. So I believe if we put this whole thing together, we can see that Satan, who was sent to this earth, he wasn't just released into the universe. He was sent to this earth when he was kicked out of heaven. is confined to this earth after the second coming, and this earth is reverted to the abusos, the abyss, the chaos, through the destruction of the second coming. So I personally believe this abyss is simply symbolic of this world in the post-second coming destruction. Now this angel has a great chain in his hand, a great chain. I'm going to call it a chain of circumstances. You can't bind demons with physical chains of steel. You couldn't bind demoniacs with physical chains of steel. But 
Notice he is bound so that he should deceive the nations no more. He has to stay on this earth, but there are no nations to deceive. He's stuck here to meditate for a thousand years on the destruction he's brought. Satan was sent here when he was thrown out of heaven. The righteous were all removed at the second coming. The saved are gone, right? We've been evacuated. The wicked are all slain by the second coming. There's no other world that wants him. I can guarantee that. If there are other worlds out there and they've seen what's going on, they are not interested in him visiting. And God has the power to say, sit, stay here. Now, why is Satan bound? We're not necessarily told, but he's bound for a thousand years of cold darkness. Remember, he wanted to be God. He wanted to take over the universe as, as God. He claims since the fallen Eden that he's the prince God or ruler of this world. He claims to have an improved alternative plan on, over gods on how to run the universe. The world has been his quarantined laboratory, his proving ground to see what the whole universe would look like if he were in charge. Now all Satan has done is exploit God's creation in order to make his thesis appear plausible. At least he's manipulated God's creation to the point where the majority of human beings have bought in with him instead of with the Lord. So now notice what God does. God removes his creative genius from this world. The second coming reverts this world to pre-creation chaos. Satan is left with a pile of raw material. It's as if God says, well, you wanted to be God? Here's the raw material. It took me a week. I'll give you a thousand years. See if you can do anything like being a creator. And of course he can't. Remember, sin is not a creation. Sin is a wrecking of God's creation. So you don't have to have a God who created sin for sin to exist, even though whatever is created, God created. Because sin is not a creation, it's a destruction of creation. All it does is wreck things. So God kind of seals Satan here. He can't leave. There's nobody to tempt. All he's got is raw material. Can he make anything, any light, any life, any, any organization? And the, and the proof will be in the pudding because he won't be able to do a thing but sit there. But then it says he must be released for a little while. So evidently after this thousand years, there's going to be a releasing of Satan. So let's, let's start with a chart here. Um, the millennium starts with the second coming of Jesus. Uh, the saved are raised. We're all alive and in heaven. From Adam all the way down. We're all together. In the honeymoon. Remember, this is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then comes the honeymoon. A thousand years in the great heavenly resort with our new groom, Jesus. All right? What's the honeymoon supposed to be about? You go to a really nice place and you spend your first few days figuring out what it's like to live together full time. Because that really is God's plan. You're not supposed to move in till after the wedding. That's God's plan. All right? The lost have all been slain and they're dead on the earth. There's nobody alive on earth in terms of the human family or animals. Creation. And Satan is bound on this desolate earth. He can't leave. That's what we learn in verses 1 to 3. Verse 4. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness of Jesus, witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on his forehead or in their hands. We'll study that tomorrow night. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. 
and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So now we're looking at during the thousand years. And the first thing it says is, I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Who is they? It goes on to tell us they are at least pointed out to be those who were beheaded for the witness to Jesus and the word of God. Remember, that's why John was on the Isle of Patmos. He witnessed to Jesus and the word of God, and they put him out there to die. Now, you have those who were martyred for Jesus, because they wouldn't be quiet about witnessing about Jesus and his word. And they are specifically pointed out now as the ones, not, not just martyrs, but notice in the passage, they not only were martyred for the witness of God and the testimony, or the, the witness of God and the word of God, witness of Jesus and the word of God, I'll get it right, but they refused the mark of the beast and the number of his name. So this will be, we'll, we'll see tomorrow night. It seems like whatever you preach, you should have preached something else first. So we'll see tomorrow night that we're all going to end up, if we live to see Jesus come, in a Daniel 3, bow or burn, bow to the image or be killed situation. And evidently, some, some will be killed. Because now these martyrs are seen sitting on thrones. He calls them souls, but remember that's whole people. How did they get there? Through the resurrection. That's, that's resurrected people, all right? Some people say, see, you've got disembodied souls. No, now you're reading stuff in that the Bible doesn't put there, okay? So they're sitting on thrones. The martyrs have been raised, and they're sitting on thrones with Christ, reigning for a thousand years. They have gone from being imprisoned and killed to being in charge, to being kings. All right? And they are the specifically here the martyrs who died at the end of time in the whole Mark of the Beast scenario. Now we know that all the rest of the righteous are there as well because everybody comes up in that first resurrection, right? And, but, but there's a reason here I think why God points out specifically that the martyrs are raised. And they're living and reigning with God for a thousand years. The martyrs are seated on thrones and they reign with Christ. It says, but the rest of the dead didn't live till the thousand years are over. Who would the rest of the dead be? It can't be the rest of the righteous because they all come up at the second coming. So it has to be the lost. The rest of the dead, the lost, will live again. Oh, so let's see. Then we could probably call at Jesus coming the first resurrection, and at the end of the thousand years will be a second resurrection. But right now, during the thousand years, all the lost remain dead on the earth. They're going to be raised again to live at the end of the thousand years. That, and then the end of verse... Um, the end of verse, well, let's read verse 5 again. But the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished, which infers what? They will live again at the end of the thousand years. Then it says this is the first resurrection. That phrase belongs with the next verse. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, okay? Over such the second death will have no power. So at the second coming, the righteous are raised. They're the blessed and holy. They are all alive in heaven. They're exempt from the second death. They'll never die again. The lost are slain and Satan is bound on this desolate earth. And then at the end of the thousand years, the lost will be raised. And the rest of the dead will live again. And that's called the second resurrection of the lost. During the thousand years, the saints and the martyrs are reigning as priests and kings with Christ. But all the lost remain dead on earth. Now let's bring in a verse here. Um, from John 5. Remember Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Do you see where those resurrections fit now? They bookend the thousand years. In fact, that phrase, resurrection of condemnation, the word condemnation is simply the common word for judgment, crises. They're raised to a resurrection of judgment, and we'll see in a few minutes that's called the white throne judgment, but we'll get there shortly. 
So the first resurrection is to life, never to die again. The second resurrection is to judgment and then to receive the second death. All right? Putting all the pieces in place, we'll understand as we go along. Again, we know what, but we don't necessarily know why, so let's dig a little deeper. Now, I want you to get what I'm going to say now. I got pretty excited about this when I learned it a few years ago. It helped things make better sense for me than, than ever I was taught as a kid and in college. Daniel chapter 7. Notice these words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. I watched because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. What we learn in here is that thrones are going to be put in place and God's going to come in and sit down. Judgment is always a seat, the judgment seat. He's surrounded by the myriads of angels. The court is seated. And books are open, there's an investigation, there's evidence presented. And as a result of that evidence, the horn and the beast are found guilty, dethroned, and executed. Okay? That's what we learn from that section. Now we move forward in the chapter to verses 13 and 14. I watched, I was watching in the night vision, so as the vision continued, the next scene, behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, who was brought near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So now we discover that when the thrones are placed and the myriads of angels gather around, the court is seated, the books are open, the investigation is done, and the guilty verdict is stated and executed by the dethroning and execution of the horn and the beast, Christ now receives the kingdom he fought for at the cross. But the beast is finally taken out of the way. Satan is finally bound and taken out of the way. And Christ receives the kingdom. Okay? Next part of chapter 7, verse 21. John said, now I was watching. This is in the interpretation portion. I was watching and the same horn was making war with the saints and prevailing against them. That's what brings on the judgment in the first place. The little horn's words against God and warring against the saints is why God finally sits down in judgment. They do the investigation. He is dethroned and executed and Christ gets the kingdom. But notice verse 22. The horn is making war until the Ancient of Days came. That's up there with uh, the thrones are placed. And judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. This is right down at the end. Now, in the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament, that phrase, judgment was made in favor of the saints, literally, I've got it up there under verse 22. He, God, gave the judgment, krisis, the word judgment. Krisis is the word for the judgment process. The whole courtroom process, investigation, evidence shown, leading to a verdict. He gave a judgment to or for the saints. I want you to notice this judgment is not something the saints necessarily need to fear or think they're going to be judged. This judgment is a gift. It says he gave, it's the word for gift. He gave a judgment for or to the saints. This is something he's giving us as a, as a benefit because the saints have been persecuted and warred against and imprisoned and tortured and killed and incarcerated by the evil one. And the judgment is going to throw out the evil one and all the judgment's going to do for the saints is set us free and vindicate us and reverse us from being incarcerated. Now the dragon's going to be incarcerated and we're going to be sitting on thrones. Amen. You follow that? What a picture. Now here, it's a promise. Verses 26 and 27, the court will be seated and they will take away his dominion, the little horn's dominion. So this is the outcome of the judgment there. The court is seated and the little horn is found guilty, dethroned and executed. 
to consume and destroy it forever. It's never coming back, and there will not be one residue left. Amen? Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the saints of the Most High. Ah, so the beast and horn have to be dethroned and destroyed. Christ then gets the kingdom. He's the rightful ruler. He won it back at Calvary. And what does he do? He hands it to us. And we will sit as priests and kings on thrones with Christ for the thousand years. You see the picture? This is not a judgment where we need to be afraid our name's going to come up for one more time and we're going to have to face those sins a second time and hopefully we'll be ready when that happens. We are ready in Christ. This is the judgment of the little horn. Okay? Now, we're not quite done with this yet. There's better stuff to come yet. We have a promise of judgment. Now we'll go to Revelation 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls. Once again, this is now a symbolic picture of the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. It's as if their blood cries out. They were martyred and their blood is crying out. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord? So their blood is crying out from the grave, as it were. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Till you judge and avenge, literally is the word right or righteous with the prefix ek or exit. Until you bring out what is right. Vengeance doesn't mean you go torture somebody for torturing you. Vengeance here, um, vengeance here means to judge and bring out the truth. Satan's been lying and he's been hurting the, the redeemed, uh, the saints. Now, judge and bring out the truth. You avenge. You promised God that if we would stay with you to the point of death and we are in the grave, our blood was shed, we're martyrs, we died for you, and you said you would judge and put things right how long do any of us ever feel that way two thousand years after the cross come on how long so you know if god promises a judgment he seems to be pretty slow at getting around to it 2500 years from daniel 7 so no wonder the blood of the martyrs is crying out symbolically here in this judgment scene how long lord come on Verse 11, a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. God says, we're getting close, but we're not quite there yet. Until both the number of their fellow servants and brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. There's a lot in that last half a sentence, but God simply says, rest a little while, there's a few more things that have to happen. I firmly believe that Jesus will not m wait one millisecond longer than necessary to bring this thing to an end. I don't know why he hasn't brought it to an end yet. I can't figure it out. I'm not God. And I have to trust that a heart of love would not let one more moment of pain and agony in this world happen than is necessary. Because God is going to make sure that when he finally ends this thing, it's ended so well that in a free universe, it'll never happen again. God goes for the long solution that will last forever. And he's not going to cut it short until that is possible. So we don't understand, but he says, hold on, the white robe, I guarantee the outcome of this thing. You are going to be vindicated. You are going to be avenged. The right is going to come out. Here's the white robe, representing uh, justification, vindication, uh, acquittal. Wait a little while, not quite done yet, but it's coming, it's coming. So now you have the martyr's blood crying out. Whose blood? Martyr's blood crying out for vindication. They're told to rest a little while longer. 
Now we jump forward to Revelation 14. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting good news to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, <clears throat> Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now, Revelation 14 says, the promised judgment has arrived. So we're moving down. You know, the promise 2,500 years ago, way deep in the process, the martyr's blood is saying, how long, Lord, have you forgotten this? No, it's coming. Revelation 14, it's judgment time. We'll look at this tomorrow night. It's come. And now... Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Who were those? The martyrs, the ones whose blood was crying out for vindication, are now seated on thrones. The souls of those who had been beheaded to their, for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who hadn't worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, they lived and reigned. The concept is as kings with Christ for a thousand years. Do you see the reversal? God promises, I'll set you free. They give their lives. They cry out, Lord, how long? Finally, in chapter 14, it's judgment time. Praise the Lord. And now, in chapter 20, the judgment has happened. It has been reversed. Who is bound? Satan. Who is sitting on thrones? The ones he condemned and killed. I like this ending, don't you? The martyrs and saints are now sitting on thrones with Christ. And notice this phrase. Judgment was given to them. But there's one very interesting... Well, first of all, first of all in the Greek... This is almost identical to Revelation or to Daniel 7:22. He gave a judgment for the saints. Here, judgment was given to or for the saints. But do you notice one slight difference? Up in verse 22 of Daniel 7, judgment is called crisis. Here in Revelation 20, verse 4, <coughs> judgment is called crema. There are two words for judgment in the, in the Greek. Crises is for the judgment process. Crema is for the judgment verdict. Now get this. He promises a crisis, a judgment process that will set them free. The martyrs say how long? Revelation 14, it's time. And then, after the second coming of Christ, what you're seeing here is not primarily telling you, it almost sounds like the saints are judging. What it's really saying is you're seeing the verdict. They sit as kings with Christ. And the one who condemned and incarcerated them is now condemned and incarcerated. The verdict is in. The judgment process is promised now the judgment verdict is pronounced and executed. The redeemed sit with God as kings and priests and reign for the thousand years. And by the way, when the thousand years are over, there seems to be a special reigning that happens then. They're going to keep right on living because they won't be hurt by the second death. Amen? They don't just get a thousand year reign and then they grow old and somebody else gets it. They're going to live forever. I don't remember exactly when it was, but I was studying this a few years ago, and I was trying to figure out what is this judgment thing in the millennium? Because I've heard people say, well, the wicked are up there judging. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the, the saved, forget the wicked, they're dead. The saved, it says judgment was given to them, so they're up there judging. Well, what are they judging? And I've heard all kinds of speculation that they're judging the lost, how long they should burn, you know. Let me ask you a question. When it comes to finally destroying the lost, what value is there to degrees of punishment? Nothing. Nothing. 
if you have two dogs that are mad with rabies and one bit a hundred people and the other bit one person, what are you going to do with the two dogs? You're going to torture this one a while because he bit more before you kill him? No, you're going to put them both out of their misery. Amen? So the idea that we're up there deciding how long the wicked are going to burn, I think, I just don't get it. That doesn't make sense to me in the whole picture. It makes no sense at all. And when I saw that it's the verdict that's given to the saints, a judgment process was promised. Now the verdict is given. We live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. But... What about this living and reigning with Christ a thousand years? I mean, it seems to be there's a special term of reigning. And when you're sitting as kings and priests, that involves some kind of judging or ruling or, or, or overseeing or something. I'm not quite sure what it means, but I do know that all through the Bible, Judgment is something you sit down to do. God sits down in judgment in Daniel 7. Pilate sat down on the judgment seat to pass the verdict to crucify Jesus. The Jews in Corinth hauled Paul before Galileo's judgment seat. Paul was summoned before the judgment seat of Festus in Caesarea where the Jews accused him. Later on, he appeals to be tried before Caesar's judgment seat as a Roman citizen. And we must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So sitting down on thrones, when God sits down, is for judgment. There may be a judgment concept here. One more verse that fits in. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? This is a one and only verse where Paul is getting after the people in Corinth because they were having problems in the church and they were going to the secular courts to get them adjudicated. And Paul says that is just, first of all, the fact that you can't get along is slandering the name of Christ. And then that you go before the people that are throwing you to the lions and crucifying you and imprisoning you for being Christians to try to get them to straighten out the mess in the church. He said, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. He says, don't you know the saints are going to judge the world? You're going to judge angels? Can't you figure things out now? I wish Paul had given us a little more of what he's talking about because he doesn't explain himself. But he does say there's some kind of judging going on, and I can't imagine that's now. That's got to be somewhere after the resurrection. And I still don't think we're judging the fate of the lost. That's, hap that, that's determined by their decision of Christ, right? They reject Christ. They choose to separate from life. A little sanctified imagination. The unfallen beings gather around for the judgment scene. We see the 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The court is seated. The books are opened. We see this again in Revelation 4 and 5. The unfallen beings get a chance to review the records of sin that are all in the archives of heaven down to thought and motive. <laughs> they can do better than we can in our courts here. In our courts here, you can't really know what anybody's thinking. There, it's recorded down to thought and motive. And the unfallen get to get all their questions answered. I mean, you and I sit around saying, God, why do you still allow children to be abused? You know. Why are you allowing this to go on? What do you think the heavenly angels? They see it all. And they get a chance to go through the records and they give the unanimous verdict. I believe Revelation shows us this. They give the unanimous verdict that God alone is just and true. And he's proven himself by time and circumstances to be the rightful ruler. He is love to the core. We on earth made our decision for Christ based on partial evidence. But let me ask you, those of you here, I hope it's every one of you, who have made an unconditional commitment of your life to Jesus, do you still from time to time wonder what in the world God is up to? Like Mary, or like Martha, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died, but yet I trust you. <laughs> Okay? 
So we actually commit to Christ here while still having unanswered questions because we have enough evidence to make a decision on. And by the way, I decided a long time ago, I'm going to make my decisions based on the evidence I have, not on the evidence I don't have. If you refuse to commit till you have all the evidence, you'll never commit to marriage, you'll never commit to a career, you'll never commit to anything. You won't even commit to get in your car and drive home because you don't know it's going to get there. So we actually now commit by faith. I believe during the thousand years we will have the opportunity to see the same evidence that the unfallen beings did before the second coming. And we will confirm our vote for God. Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose you move into heaven, into your mansion, and next door you go over to visit and it turns out to be Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, living next door in heaven. And you look around all over heaven and Billy Graham is missing. Would you have any questions? Yeah. It doesn't seem right. You trust God, but what are you doing? Uh, or let's say you move into your mansion and the person who lived next door, uh, well, first of all, you move into your mansion and in heaven your son or daughter are missing. And the person who led them into sin lives next door. Would you have any questions? So you ask the first passing angel, is it okay to ask questions around here? And the angel says, no, trust God, he knows what he's doing. How would you feel about that? You know, 20 gazillion eons into eternity, it's still just kind of bugging you. This didn't seem right. You asked the first passing angel, can we ask questions? The angel said, yeah, what's your question? You explain your dilemma. The angel says, well, let's go look at the records. The records are open. And I believe we will be able to see that every questionable thing we had concerning God, why did you act this way? Why did you allow that? You know, why'd you kill us? You know, some of these questions from the Old Testament and other things. Um, I believe we will get to see down to thought and motive just like the unfallen did before the second coming. And we will settle in during the thousand years, the honeymoon. We'll settle into life with God with full knowledge. So there is a judging, I think, going on during the thousand years. But it's us having the opportunity to judge for ourselves based on full disclosure and affirm what we'd already decided on faith from partial disclosure. Now we see in part, but then we'll see absolutely completely. Now there's one piece of good news here. There is one aspect of the record of what happened on earth that will not be available. In fact, it will be completely wiped out. And what is that? The sins of the redeemed. So I, I want to tell you this. If you get to heaven and you want to see what I did and I'm there, my record's going to be blank. Praise the Lord. And if you want to make sure nobody can read about your sins, you better be there. <laughs> okay? So I believe there is an aspect of judging for ourselves, getting the same opportunity to sit down in judgment. Not that we doubt God, not that we question Him. But we've moved on faith. And we love God. We are committed to him to the death. But we still have a few questions when we get a chance, don't we? I think we'll get that all settled during the thousand years. The, the uh, saints live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years are completed. And then they do live again. Okay. Revelation 20 verse 7. in your Bibles. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released. Remember he was bound with no one to deceive for a thousand years. Now he'll be released and go out to deceive the nations. So Satan is released. What would release him so he could deceive the nations? The second resurrection, the nations are raised, okay? And he immediately goes out to deceive. The chain of circumstances with no one to tempt is reversed and there's a period of time right now where everyone is alive who ever lived on planet Earth. All the redeemed are in the city, all the lost are outside.
When the thousand years were expired, Satan was released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, kind of evil and the mother of evil, to gather them together to battle whose name whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Okay, we've got a few questions to answer here. Satan is released. How is he released? By the resurrection of the lost. He immediately goes out to deceive. He's been deceiving from the beginning in heaven where he's deceived a third of the angels into believing there was something wrong with God when there was nothing wrong. He brought his war to this world. Adam and Eve invited him in. He's been warring against Christ. He's been warring against God's people. He's been causing untold bloodshed on this world. And now for a thousand years, he hasn't got a thing to do. There's no one to incite into war anymore. But the minute he's free, by having the lost raised again, he goes out to deceive. And it says they surround the camp of the saints, the city. Now, wait a minute. I thought we went up to heaven. To the New Jerusalem. What's the New Jerusalem doing on earth and when did it get here? Well, go to Revelation 21, verse 2. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, or the dwelling place of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be their God. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved will walk in its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates will not be shut at all by day, and there is no night. So evidently, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place, I'm going to come back and get you, and then I'll take you to the place I prepared. Well, evidently that place is going to end up descending down to the earth. John said, I saw it coming down and settling on the earth. And the gates will be open eventually, and the inhabitants of the earth will flow in and out. We're talking the new earth here. We're talking after, after recreation. We haven't really talked about that much yet, but that seems to be the picture. We aren't told exactly when the city comes down, but obviously from reading Revelation 20, by the end of the thousand years, it's come down. So I'm going to suggest that about the end of the thousand years, the city descends to this earth. The lost are raised. They re, they're, they, there's a judgment and they'll end up receiving the second death. Satan is released to deceive by the lost being raised. And he actually gets the lost to surround the city. And then fire comes down from God and devours them. Interesting picture of which we don't have a lot of pieces. And then look at verse 10. And the devil was cast into the lake of fire. The devil who deceived them into trying to take the city was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We have some questions to answer there. But the basic flow is the city descends, the lost are raised, thus Satan is released. He goes out to deceive. He convinces them to try to take the city. Now think about that. This city is one gorgeous place. Read about it in chapter 21 tonight. Its building blocks are like gold and rubies and diamonds and things like that. Those aren't decorations. That's the stuff. You know, the story is told of the, the rich man who finally talked God into letting him bring a little of his gold from earth to heaven. And as he gets to the pearly gates, Peter says, what you got in the bag? You can't bring anything in. He said, I, I, he said I, I struck a bargain with God. He said, I could bring a little something. Well, what is it? Man opens his bag, and Peter looks in, and he says, pavement? The streets are paved of gold. You got that? Okay. The point being, the people outside the city have lived for money and power and control. And they see all that gorgeous stuff, and they say, we want a piece of it. They're raised. They're deceived. Come on, there's more of us than them. Let's go get it. And when they try, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. And then Satan gets cast into the lake of fire. Where he will be, it says, tormented day and night forever and ever. 
That is the toughest passage in the entire Bible to deal with if you don't believe it, a burning hell forever and ever is taught anywhere else. It kind of sounds like it's taught right there. So let's try to deal with that. First of all, this is a symbolic passage in a symbolic book. Isn't that right? Revelation 20 verse 10 says the devil was cast in the lake of fire tormented day and night. This is a symbolic passage in a symbolic book. I'm a little uncomfortable suddenly going literal. Okay? But what does it mean? Secondly, notice fire came down from heaven and devoured all the lost. It doesn't say they're tormented day and night forever and ever. The only ones mentioned for being tormented day and night forever are the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. The beast and the false prophet are systems of evil, not individuals. But it does say day and night forever and ever, tormented. In fact, the Bible says Satan's going to come to ashes. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought, brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. So which is it? Is he roasting forever and ever in some corner of the universe? Or is he turned to ashes and gone forever? So we have to deal with the word torment. I found some interesting stuff on torment. First of all, it can mean physical suffering. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. That sounds like physical torment, right? In 2 Peter 2.8, the righteous man, speaking of Lot, dwelling among them, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing his lawless deeds. Is that physical torment or emotional torment? That would be emotional or mental torment. So this word can mean physical torment, this word can mean mental torment, and now a third verse, which I found interesting. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. This is when the disciples are out, and Jesus is sleeping in the front of the boat, and the waves are starting to come in the boat, and they cry out, Lord, save us, we're perishing. It says, the boat was tormented. That's the word tossed there in the Greek. The boat was tormented by the waves. Now, was that physical suffering? No. Was that mental suffering? No. What's, how do you torment a boat? Evidently, putting water in a boat is tormenting a boat. You got that? A boat is made to float, so when you make it sink, you're tormenting it. You got that? So inhibiting something from doing what it wants to do is a torment. Are you with me? An inhibiting force. Mark 6, 47, speaking of the same event, but with slightly different words, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw them tormented at rowing. <laughs> now, that may have been some physical pain in the muscles, but that's not the point. They're rowing one way, and the wind's blowing them the other. <laughs> and no matter how hard they try, they cannot make progress against the wind, and that's called tormented at rowing. I find that tormenting can simply mean being inhibited from what you want to do. Inhibiting the boat from floating, inhibiting the disciples from making headway against the wind. So here's what I conclude on this torment. It is symbolic in this passage, so I can let it be symbolic. God is going to put the devil, the beast, and the false prophet not in the physical discomfort or mental anguish because they're going to be destroyed. But how long will they be destroyed for? Forever and ever. They're never coming back. Now remember, no one has life except when God keeps them living. Therefore, if there's an eternal burning place for anybody, including Satan himself, the highest of God's creations. God has to be deliberately keeping that individual alive in the flames. That doesn't fit God. That doesn't fit God at all. He says he'll bring him to ashes. 
But we can conclude then that the fiery burning glory of God, how long will that last? Forever. We're going to live in the fire. Remember we read that on Tuesday night? The righteous burn forever, not the lost. But the fire that fuels our life, the glory that fi fuels our life, is a annihilating fire to all evil and sin and darkness. So here's the way I see it. God's eternal burning glory will forever inhibit Satan's destructive ideas. Not only will he be gone, but his ideas will never come up again. He'll get, that'll happen by destroying Satan and sin forever. And that continued glory of God will prevent sin or anything like it from ever rising again as light prevents darkness. Now, should anyone else a gazillion eons into eternity decide to pull Lucifer, turn love upside down into selfishness, turn service into control, turn giving into trading, turn humility into pride, are we going to have to do this all over again? It's in the records that it was voted out by unanimous vote the first time after much pain and suffering. And I'm convinced the burning glory of God will simply vaporize any such ideas. But we're told they'll never come up. But if they did, they won't get a footing because his glory will torment it. So Satan is not only the being but the concept of evil now. And that will be tormented forever, day and night, forever and ever, by the burning presence of God. It'll never happen again. That's our guarantee. Okay? We're doing some reasoning here. Let's wrap it up. There are two deaths and two resurrections. Between Eden and the second coming, we all experience the first death and we're in the graves. At the second coming, at the first resurrection of the blessed and holy, the resurrection of life, the saved live and reign with Christ for the thousand years. And then they keep right on living. Okay? At the second resurrection, the rest of the dead come to life. That's the lost of, to the resurrection of judgment or condemnation. And that judgment is called the white throne judgment. And during that period of time, everyone is alive who's ever been alive at the same time. This is what you call a judgment scene where everybody's present. Nobody's kept outside. It's a totally open process. And that judgment scene is shown in verses 11 to 15. So let's read that. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that are written in the book. So this would be the resurrected dead. You see, because verse 13, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, death in the grave, or Hades delivered up the dead that were in it. That's the second resurrection. And they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So God raises the wicked not just to kill him again, but he has to have a reason. And the reason is there is this white throne judgment. Now, notice, God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they turn and live. So God would not raise the lost just to kill him again. There has to be a reason that he raises the lost. And that's what I want to try to look at as we wrap this up tonight. Isaiah 45 verses 22 to 24 makes a prophecy. God says, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. I have sworn by myself, because that's the highest thing to swear by, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear and they will say, this is every knee and every tongue, only in the Lord, and that's the official name of God, Yehovah, Elohim, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him, and all who are angry at him will be put to shame. What does that tell us? There is a point when every knee will bow and every tongue will swear that God alone is righteous. 
Right now, Satan and the wicked are saying God is unrighteous. There must come a time when they say God is righteous. Evidently, God is going to win this great controversy by unanimous vote so that in the records of eternity, it will be known that both the saved and the lost and the unfallen all unanimously agreed when they saw the final evidence that God alone is just and true. And even the lost will agree to their own demise that their own destruction is the justice of God and the most loving thing he could do. So I actually believe now at the white throne judgment, this is a third phase of judgment. We've got to look at the three phases quickly in order to put it together. Before the second coming, the unfallen universe gathers around the 10,000 times 10,000, Daniel 7, Revelation 4 and 5, in heaven. And the little horn, evil Satan, is judged. And it's a question of the little horn versus God's character. And of course, that was that Satan and that and his character versus God and his came to a head at the cross, right? And everything else is, is playing off of that. But before the second coming, all the unfallen universe unanimously agree by looking at all the records that God alone is the winner and Satan alone is the loser. And there's no doubt, there's no gray area, it's black and white. We voted the same thing by faith without understanding it all, but we had enough to make a decision. During the thousand years, phase two of the judgment, we get to upgrade our understanding with all of our questions and answers because we get to go through the records. And by the end of the thousand years, we won't have any questions left. And yet I want to suggest something. I'll bet money on it that every single saint in that city at some time during that thousand years will say to God, my loved one, my son, my daughter, my spouse, my parent, whatever, who's not here, if they could have seen this, they would have chosen. God, if they just had a chance to, to see it, truly see it, I know they'd want it. I know they'd repent. Now I'm making this up, okay? It's as if God finally, at the close of the thousand years, said every last one of you thinks there's somebody on, who's dead right now that would have chosen this if they could have just seen it, that they really didn't have a fair shot. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring them all up. And we're going to let them all see it. And we're going to see if anybody changes their mind. You might say, I don't believe God gives a second chance, but he gives a second chance because he, even though he doesn't. <laughs> he knows no one will change their mind because he knows down to the heart and motive. But we don't. The angels don't. And so he brings all the lost up and we go through it one more time. They see everything from top to bottom down to thought and motive in their own hearts. And they end up constrained by the evidence on their knees saying, you win, uncle. <laughs> you might say God twists their arm with the solid evidence until they can do nothing but bow the knee, including Satan himself, and say, you were right all along. Oh, I hate it when I have to do that, don't you? And you know what? We're going to be inside the city and they're all going to be bowing on their knees. And we're going to be saying, God, look at that. They've all repented. We should have been universalists. Open the gates, let them in. They're all on their knees before you. And it's as if God says, well, let's, let's let that vision fade and see what happens. A mind convinced against its will is of the same opinion still. That's why God doesn't overwhelm us with evidence now. We wouldn't know who's true and who's false. But he gives enough to make a decision. There it's going to be overwhelming. Straight from the books, down to thought and motive. They're all on their knees. God lets that vision fade. And what do they do? They rise and say, you may be right, but we're going to take that city. And we'll discover that not one of the lost would have changed their mind if they'd have seen the city because they'll see the city and their minds will be unchanged. And I believe this great white throne judgment proves that God didn't lose one. God didn't miss one. 
Everyone he could, who he could save, he saved. And the only ones that weren't saved were those who repeatedly and strenuously refused to let him save them. And now their hearts are unchangeable. And they actually, after admitting God is just and fair, turn and try to attack and destroy. And fire comes down from God out of heaven. The most merciful thing God can do now is to not let that mess slowly melt down to death, but just put it out in the moment. The unfallen before the second coming, the redeemed during the thousand years, finally the fallen are raised. Everybody gets to see all the evidence from top to bottom, and in the end every knee has bowed, but the hearts outside aren't changed. That's proven by their trying to take the city. Therefore, it's almost as if God now looks around and says, I know that's some of your loved ones out there. But what is the most merciful thing I can do at this moment? And I think through our tears. I don't think the tears are gone yet. This will not be an exciting moment for God or us. But I believe through our tears we're going to say, God, the most merciful thing you can do is to bring this to a quick and final end. And fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. And I believe Satan is devoured in that fire. The only thing that's tormented forever and ever is his ideas. They're never coming back again. They'll be prevented by the glory of God. God must win by unanimous vote in order to make sure there's not one festering doubt of darkness in any corner of the universe that can ever grow up again into the seeds of sin. It seems like an awfully long route to the close, but it's the right route that will result in an eternal end with no sin. So, let's wrap it up. The beginning of the thousand years, the second coming, he comes to get the saints, raises them, uh, takes them all alive to heaven. They're changed and translated. That's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. They'll be exempt from the second death, will never die again. The lost are slain and dead on the earth. The earth is made desolate. Satan is bound, and that ends the first phase of the judgment. During the thousand years, we're in heaven, reigning with Christ, free and vindicated, kings and priests. That's the honeymoon with the Lamb, our, our, our groom, our husband. The lost remain dead on the earth. None are alive on the earth. The earth is desolate, Satan is bound, and that's phase two of the judgment where we get to see the records. At the end of the thousand years, the city descends. The second resurrection of the lost releases Satan to deceive. They surround the city. They see God high and lifted up, the white throne judgment. They get a chance to see down the thought and motive, everything that happened, and get all their questions answered. Every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. But they get up to destroy the city anyway. Fire destroys and purifies the earth is recreated as it was in Eden. The saints will inherit the earth, and that closes phase three of the judgment. Do you see the picture? It all pulls together, and we will live forever and ever in a universe that is completely free of sin. Truly, God is worthy of our love, our loyalty, our honor, and our praise. Let's pray. Jesus, we've seen a beautiful picture tonight. It's got some pieces that we don't really like, but we thank you that you, who are so much wiser than us, are going to wrap this thing up in a way so that sin will never, ever crop up again. But we will still be free. Lord, on this earth, the only way we know to keep things from cropping up again is to control and overpower. But you will do it by the power of love alone. And we will live as free creatures in a free and gorgeous and glorious universe where not a taint of sin is anymore except the reminder in the marks on your hands and we will live secure that sin will never rise again but we will be free in you thank you thank you for taking the long route sometimes we cry how long O Lord but we choose to trust you to take the long route to the eternal end that will be good to the core and we thank you for this in Jesus name Amen.